the multitudes of smart technologies to surface in baby tech, this next category is known to be one of the most stressful jobs of parenting, feeding the baby. There's been a massive growth in the last couple of years with many leading edge innovations arriving on the scene with new forms of feeding solutions. Joining us to spotlight these innovators and lead this discussion is on-air tech expert, writer, and founder of TechSesh.com, social media influencer, and soon-to-be first-time mom, Jessica Naziri. Hi, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Thank you all. This is so exciting to be here on stage this year. I've been attending CES for the past nine years. And as the founder of TechSesh, my job is to try out the latest gadgets. So every year when I come here, I scope out the gadgets and I get to try them. But I've never really had the chance to do that with baby tech. So this is my year. I'm very excited. It's exciting to be here among such an esteemed group. Um, Throughout time, we see technology advancing, and sometimes it's been advancing for the sake of advancing in technology. I think within the baby tech realm, it's changing and we're solving problems. There's so many pain points, and within this realm, we see problems, and now we're actually doing things about it. As a millennial mom-to-be, I think that now we have more choices. We want more, we want to know more, we want to learn about it, and it's exciting to be part of this wave and see what's next. So everyone here on this panel is solving such problems. We're gonna dive deep. This has been going on for years, breastfeeding, and we're changing that landscape. So let's go straight into it. If you can all just introduce yourselves, tell us about your company, and how many years have you been coming to CES for? Hi, I'm Gisela, co-founder of Blue Smart. Uh, this is our second year. We are here launch our uh, first generation Blue Smart Mia product last year, and uh, we won the best baby tech. Very likely. Nice, congrats! And, uh, thank you. And this year, Mia Chu is the second generation. Uh, we got um, very honored by uh, Innovation Award honoring. Congratulations! Yeah. So Mia Chu is, uh, as you can see, is a smart sleeve. It fits into whatever bottle you want to use, because we all know that baby has a bottle preference, right? So you put your own baby bottle in, it will become a smart bottle. It will track how much the baby has been feeding, the temperature, duration, and angle, and everything syncs to your smart mobile app. I'm a new mom myself, my son is seven months old, and his daycare been using this product every single day. It's such a um, relief for me because I can check every feeding goes on and get all the information. Great, thank you. And if you can tell us about yourself and your product, Hi everyone, I'm Tanya Bowler and I've traveled from London. This is my first ever CES. So I started LV five years ago. Before then my background was in women's sexual reproductive health. So I have a PhD in HIV prevention. I'd worked in a range of women's health issues. And then I, got, I became a mum myself seven years ago. And I realized how little I actually knew about women's health. So going through that process, being pregnant and having a baby, I really felt that it wasn't much in terms of information, resources, and technology. And that was very much the genesis for the idea for the first product, which was LV Trainer. It's a pelvic floor trainer. We launched that three years ago. And as soon as we launched that product, we realized really the biggest space was this, this new mum space and technology to help women's lives easier. And that's when we came up with, why don't we completely redesign the breast pump? So I don't know how many of you are familiar with the breast pump and the traditional architecture. It's a product that has not been innovated for a long time. It's difficult to use, it's heavy, it can be painful, you're tethered to a wall. So we thought, what if we could just completely turn that on its head? So we developed LV Pump, which is the world's first silent wearable breast pump, which is this. Great, thank you for bringing that over. And we have all the products here, so we'll go through them and discuss everything as well. Thank you, I'm Noreen Savlatsky. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Emilac, along with my daughter, Rachel, who is nine months pregnant, so cannot be here with us today. We have developed Nurture by Emilac, which is a, um, a massage system for breastfeeding women that's designed to be used in conjunction with a breast pump to increase the efficiency of the traditional suction breast pump. More than 80% of women these days initiate breastfeeding because of the well-known health benefits, but more than 60% of them fail at this. 
and lactation specialists recommend that you do hands-on pumping. So what we've developed is a all day long nursing and pumping bra that the woman can wear to work all day long. And then when they're ready to pump, they insert an attachable massage cup which massages the breast from the back of the chest wall forward. You can control the speed, the pressure the whole time and save preferences and it decreases the amount of time in our beta testing by 72% that it costs, takes to pump and increases the production of milk by over 30% per session along with decreasing clogged milk ducts and mastitis and engorgement. So I want to shout out to my friend who just had a baby and she obviously doesn't know about this product so she uses her electric toothbrush to massage her breasts to pump. Clearly there's a, a pain point here, there's something to be solved. Um, it, it's safe to say that breastfeeding is not just about nutrition, it's actually a lot about a female's identity. I'm curious to know here in the audience how many of you have breastfed? Raise your hand. I want to see the men raise your hand. No. <laughs> Can you raise them higher if you don't mind? Okay. And then who decided it's not for them? Okay. And who just had difficulty? So we have some numbers up and you know this is something that's very different for every person. There's no right or wrong. But often what we do find is when we can't breastfeed, there's a stigma attached to it. There's this norm where Whoever breastfeeds has a better opportunity of having a child maybe with a better immune system. I don't know if that's 100% accurate. Any doctors in the room, I think there's still a lot of studies being shown. Um, but for me, I want to know at what point did you know that your product, is there, that there was a market fit for it, that there was a need, um, and that you said, okay, it's time for me to, to create this product. Maybe we can start with you, Noreen. Well, for example, we received FDA approval um, to go to market as a class one medical device based solely on the literature. There's so much literature that's already published that shows how beneficial hand massage and hands-on pumping is. Um, we, can, we did this because initially my daughter who was pumping and breastfeeding and all the women that we talked to, this is a problem, this is a solution to a problem that all women who are pumping really understand. Most women go back to work. You spend a huge amount of, of time of your day pumping this, you know, and it and you aren't able to really do anything. You can't multitask, you can't, you know, do your work or even eat your lunch. You're relegated to the back room. And so we get lots of and lots of stories in from women who are really having a problem it's a huge stress point for the woman for the family and we're trying to come up with a solution to make that a little bit easier did you want to answer as well well for me uh, when I started LV I then got pregnant with my second child so it was very much personal experience of pumping and having to go through using this technology which was difficult to use and had not been innovated in for a long time. So it was actually, I was very angry, like angry that I had to put up with such bad products. We had launched the products, our first products, we were thinking about the breast pump. So in terms of how did we identify a product market fit, obviously it wasn't just based on my personal experiences. We knew the US was a key market for us, so 50% of global revenue for breast pumps is here in the US. So we set up a parallel research stream, doing focus group discussions in the UK and the US, and really trying to identify what were the needs. So you end up with a kind of a pyramid of needs. I mean, at the very base, you have to have a pump that produces the amount of milk you want in the set amount of time. And then it's really finding out what it is that's gonna make a real difference to women's lives. And you had a different experience. So, so can you tell us about that going on to market? Right, first of all, I'm, I'm still a breastfeeding mom. I, I can tell you, I just, I just told them, I pumped on the way this morning for my baby because the baby is not, uh, not allowed in the, in the sense. Um, and the reason that we designed a small product like Mia is because we noticed that a lot of women that are doing so well in the career and uh, after they have baby, they decided either not going back to work or they come back to work but still feel very distracted. You have to make phone calls all the time to find out what's going on with my baby's feelings. Is baby getting enough today or not? And we just said with so many technology being trying to develop to convenient um, people's life, people's work, 
there's so little technology focusing baby tech. So we wanted to come up with a product that can actually benefit uh, women to release mom to be able to help them find the balance between work and the life back. Exactly, balance. So I think a lot of this has to do with balance and finding what's right for you. So when it comes to bringing it into the market, at what point did you say, okay, this is the sort of product on the market that I know will do well? You know, was it you sold a certain amount? Because I know you're already in the market in the UK, you're coming here now. Or when did you say, okay, this is something that will, will work? Yeah. yeah, well, so a breast pump is a medical device. It's a category two medical device. So it involves a lot of rigorous R&D. And really throughout that process, you have to just put women at the center of that design. So we had over 200 women testing the product, making sure that it was meeting their expectations. We then launched in the UK about two months ago. We've just got FDA clearance, so we're launching here in the US on the 7th of February. Congratulations. And how about yourself? So for us, we additionally, that we were in development for two and a half years testing us on people. We do know that it, our product in particular decreased the amount of pumping time by 72% and increased the volume of milk per pumping session by 32%. But it, in addition to that, even though we're just starting to launch the product and it won't be available until Q2 2019, we're flooded every day by hundreds of emails from people requesting, can they get this now? Can they beta test it now? Another thing is that babies that are born prematurely, which is 10 to 15 percent of the babies in the United States, all those women have to exclusively pump. And so we are constantly, it's heartbreaking, the stories that we're actually getting for people trying to find a solution because, like you said, the technology has been very slow in coming to market to really make improvements on this, which is a, rare, a very important problem for us to solve. These technologies will continue to change culture, but what do you say to those women who say, you know, we've been doing this for so many years now, I don't want to be revolutionary, I don't want it to be in the background, I want people to see, I feel comfortable with this. What do you have to say to that group and changing society and culture and the way that we think about breastfeeding through technology? Well, I fundamentally believe it's a woman's choice how she wants to feed her baby. So for women who don't need to use a pump or don't want to use a pump, that's absolutely great for those women. But more than 80% of women do use pumps. And also more critically, when you ask women who after they've had their babies, more than 80% say that they regret how early they gave up giving breast milk to their babies. So if we can just make a small impact on that number, if we can just help more women fulfill their needs around breast pumping, that's making a big difference in terms of for the health of the baby, for the health of the family. I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Both your products are meant to be discreet. So no one knows you're pumping. You could be at work and pump. What do you have to say to those people like, I wanna be out in the open, it doesn't matter. We're living in the Me Too movement. Why do I have to hide feeding my baby for free, by the way? Um, what do you have to say to them? Are we, are we going back on all these movements we're going forward towards? Well, do you realize that breastfeeding in public just became legal in all 50 states within the past six months. So whether, regardless of what the woman feels about it, there, especially in Western society, there is still a stigma uh, attached to it. In fact, yesterday we did a live activation of a woman breast pumping, two women in our booth, and even though we did it to make a statement that it is okay to be doing this, and I, we love the publicity, but I do have to say that we were featured as in two different articles as the weirdest thing that was happening at CES, of all the weird things <laughs> and unusual things. So it's still, we have a long way to go, whether regardless of how the woman feels about it to, in our society to really normalize this and to make everyone understand that this is a health issue, that this is okay, that people need to be able to be breastfeeding or pumping wherever they need to do it or wherever they're comfortable doing it. And I would play devil's advocate and say there's a big difference between hiding and discreet and hands-free. Women want a discreet and hands-free pump so that they can get on and do whatever it is they're doing in their daily lives. And I would say that is empowering and it's very much a feminist uh, brand to give women back that confidence and control. Absolutely. Now, 
some would say we're just getting started in this realm of mom 2.0, um, of you know wired babies. Where would you say where we are right now? Are we at a tipping point? Um, why now? Why are there so many different uh, people coming out into the market, changing the functionalities and the formalities of all this baby technology? Maybe you can answer. Can you can you can you repeat? Yeah. Why why are we why is this starting now? Why after you know maybe the past like four years I've been coming to CES often I see there's a really big presence in the baby tech sector. Why is this happening now? I think it uh, you know because as a millennial mom myself I think it's the time that um, so many new technology like AI, IoT technology booming up and the people really started to looking into baby tech. And uh, except for baby monitor, what else you have now, right? And also because the modern days, we just become busy and busy. Also, data that so many more women choose to go back to work after maternity leave. So I think we deserve to use a little bit of technology to make our life easier. Our, one of the mission of um, Blue Smart is doing is that we just simplify parenting. That means that we deserve to use more tech product to just get a little bit extra out and uh, take the guest work out. Like you have Mia, so you don't need to, to guess what's going on with your baby, with other caregivers. So you can focus on work. And uh, I'm a mom, but I want to be myself also. I want to be able to continue to purchase my career dream while I'll be able to find my family and the baby is taken care of. So it's like you get assurance. So I feel um, baby, and the kids and the family technology, that, that is why it's been booming. Like with people like us, we wanted to help, you know. You brought up a great point where you we're taking out the guesswork. I'm now six months pregnant, um, my first child, and I didn't feel kicking until last week. So for a long time, I was worried. I had no idea what was going on. I was convinced I should call my doctor to make sure everything was okay. And yesterday, I walked on the show floor. I've seen a lot of iterations of previous years, but I saw one device where I would strap, um, I would strap a device on me, and then it would check the baby, and I would have results in the morning through an app. So we're empowering women to have all this technology and feel assured they can rest assured that everything is okay. But also, I can see people going a little crazy with too much data. Maybe we're giving too much information to moms now. It's not a medical device. It's just a monitoring device of how many times the baby kicked, how I slept throughout the night. But with this technology, there are some dangers as well where we have to make sure there's a fine line between a medical device and a monitor. And when we give too much power to moms, I myself might go a little crazy. Where do we stand with that? And how do we make sure that everyone's you know, complying and everyone feels good and kosher about everything that's in their home and their baby? Um. Well, I think a lot of that is individual choice. And uh, I, to say we're at the tipping point would be naive. I mean, those of us that had the first, saw the first computer how many years ago, so I'm reluctant to go there of what's going to come in the future. But I would like to point out that for the first time, what you're seeing are three women. There, we have more women designing products for women, and I think that this in particular with the breastfeeding issue is something that until we had women that were stepping forth as entrepreneurs in the technology field, that the problems were not getting solved for women the way you have said that you were, the way ours came about and yours as well. So ours are some, a few of these pro products that we're talking about even though they're high tech, they're solving a real problem that people are still dealing with. And as far as where we go, who knows in the future, I would be. Yeah, and I would agree as well. I think in terms of, do we have too much tech for women? Are we near the peak? I would say absolutely not. Women have been really overlooked and neglected. I think partly because there's an assumption that women are not early and avid adopters of technology. And often, you know, products for women are designed very much at the aesthetic level, maybe make it pink or, or change the design. Pink it and shrink it. Exactly. Um, so I think this panel here and what we're seeing a lot of innovation at CS are really great products solving real problems for women. And I want to take it back. This, these devices we're creating here, is this meant for all women? Should breastfeeding be a privilege or a right? You know, they are, ex they're, they are expensive. We have different models out where you can use insurance to take home the product 
And then some would say maybe we can, because it's expensive, maybe my insurance doesn't cover, it's a newer product, maybe there's a rental market out there. I'm curious to know, would you take that route? Um, are you working with insurance companies and how is that process for other people who want to bring their product on board as well? Yeah, so I think whenever you're really innovating and redesigning a category, that you know, our product uses a lot of best in category technology. So it is at a premium price point. It's 499 for a double breast pump. But you're absolutely right about the insurance market. It's so critical. I mean, ultimately, the breast pump is an essential product for new mums. So under the Affordable Care Act, women can have up to $200 subsidy. And 20% of that market will be an upgrade option. So that we're offering more and more choice to consumers. So for LV Pump, the plan is absolutely to broaden access through being an upgrade option and also making sure you can use FSA and HSA credits towards it. So out of pocket, you're looking at about $180 for a double. Uh, aside, and I can address with us the healthcare search, but it has been an estimate that over 13 billion dollars annually would be saved if, in health care costs if women breastfed their babies for just up to six month period of time recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. That's one way. It's not a personalized way. The other thing is, is that even though your pump might be expensive or your accessory is expensive, formula is very expensive. And so are the, you know, the health benefits to both the mother and the baby are so well documented, there's not even really a conversation to have about it anymore. For us personally, we are developing a rental system that will make it more affordable. We're very conscious of trying to make this as cost effective as possible to make it accessible to most people. And for us, because we are an accessory to a breast pump, we are working towards, um, especially in the hospital, having a situation that's a brand new product. There's nothing like this on the market. It's quite a process to get an insurance code, but you can do it through a health savings or, or FSA right now. Can I, can I point out, so we're, we're doing something different. Um, Mia is not that expensive, it's $99, but still, you know, it, uh, some parents say, I, I don't want to spend $100. So what we're doing is uh, we are uh, team up with daycares. As myself, uh, my son is going to the daycare, we realize that it's the best place for the parents to have Mia product to use because it's automatic tracking. You know what's going on with your baby's feeding in the daycare and uh, all the data is, um, is passively generated and uh, in a way that you don't need to buy a product, you just, you know, download our app and the sign up uh, account. You pay like $10 a month, you can, you can do all the benefits. And then through the app, you track all the feeding and the time. Even and diaper everything. changes. Oh, even diaper changes. You have changes. everything. Yeah. So how does that work with diaper changes? Oh no, the diaper changes is like we develop an ecosystem for the daycare to use. Oh. So you, you have a dashboard, all the teachers can monitor all the babies in the room. You will know the diapers, the, the napping time, the, uh, the feeding and the solid. Wow, okay, that's interesting. So you're using a daycare to monitor your child, and I'm sure by having that device in the daycare, other mothers want to know what's happening and they want to check in on their infants as well. Exactly. This brings me to another point. Right now we're living in the age of social media. And in a sense, products are creating forums. You know, mommy bloggers are huge right now. People have more voices, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whatever it is. There's just so much out there. So what are you doing to create community? What are you doing out there in terms of getting your word out there in social media? So we, we already teamed up with uh, a bunch of um, influencer moms on YouTube and Instagram. So we, we will send them product to review. That's what we're doing now. But also, um, you know, from time to time, we're doing some campaign, like uh, we did like a bread mom campaign, or like, you know, um, sharing the positive story about parenting, because, you know, you heard so many negative stories about like how awful, how tired you are. But, you know, having my baby, I feel like it just brings you so much joy. So we want to encourage, you know, those women who hasn't become mom yet, or just struggling, because you, you heard a lot of like, uh, you know, after, maternity, like uh, the disorder of depression, right? We want to encourage more women. We want to encourage them to step back to the normal lives, find the balance back, and also, you know, to be able to become a working mom, become a happy mom. So that's what we're doing now. 
Yeah, it's a really good question. I think with social, it's changing so much of what we're doing. So the, the two sides to that in terms of launching a new product. The first is, you know, that the decisions, the way people make decisions around what products to purchase is deeply affected now by social, as you were saying, to the, the role of peer reviews. So it means really for any of us launching new products, we have to be, you know, really hold ourselves to, to, to very high standards from every touch point, from customer service, from product, um, because ultimately there's a real product democracy going on. So that, that's what, how it's playing out on social. The flip side, which is very positive, I think, is as a small company, when you're launching a more innovative product, we're never going to have the same marketing or advertising spend as some of the big brands. But really, if your product is offering something different, something unique, something to talk about, social has incredible potential to, to really to see explosive organic growth around that. I agree. This is the biggest focus. Luckily, that our demographic are young women that are more tech savvy, they are online, they are on social media, they are belonging to mommy groups and blogging groups. They do look on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and we have a very active campaign and I think it's a lucky time for people in this market that we are able to reach a very broad market through social media and reaching out to bloggers and influencers and doing our own then than we had in times past. So this is a way that technology is very much working to our advantage to be able to, to have a startup company like this and still be able to reach a broad range of people that we ordinarily would not have been able to do with a, a, uh, the, the, the budgets that we have. Right now, you don't necessarily even need a budget. With social media, that's free. Of course, you know you can have paid advertising. You don't necessarily need to take that route. But another way that you can put it all together, you just ha you could use your iPhone, take a photo of the product, send it out to some moms, maybe influencers. Some do exchange product uh, for play, and then others take a different route. Um, and I can see that getting expensive. So. I would love to know, just out of curiosity, um, with the different people you've reached out to, what was the feedback? Did anyone just, you know, give you feedback that would that would help in terms of reiterating or making it like a 2.0, or was it just like, okay, great, I'll take the product and I'll post about it? Because I want to know how these reviews are actually sent and what that looks like. For us, the feedback has really been more in the form of confirmation of need. The people that write to us. Uh, write quite intricate, long stories about why, and it really affirms what's happening. We have gotten some feedback on the product through social media, but I would say the, the vast majority of it is real validation of what we're doing. So. Yeah, so we've just launched in the UK. It's been about six weeks. So it's about getting the product out there. And what we're finding in terms of influencers and how they're posting is ultimately this is a completely different pumping experience. So it's totally hands-free. So you can do things you never could have imagined you can do whilst pumping. So we have people sharing all the times kind of all the, the new crazy things they're doing with LV Pump. Just last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a woman who was getting married. So she had a dress fitted so she could be pumping as she was going down the aisle. We've had women who are on holiday in Ibiza in their bikinis. So it's a very liberating thing and they're quite excited to be sharing. And that's you know, good look what I can do. Yeah. It's fantastic, yeah. We, we, we heard a lot of influencers told me like, oh. <laughs> so uh, they all told me like, I wish this, te this technology exists when I was still um, feeding my baby. And also uh, we just interviewed uh, um, a mom who has a preemie in Napa Valley. So she told me like, oh, this is the best baby tech I purchased this summer. I was like, this is very reassuring for us because it's like kind of like um, um, make what are we doing now um, feel like something very um, comforting because we, we know that we actually bring value to those parents. So for 2020, what's the next iteration when I see you all on stage? You'll have a successful campaign on Kickstarter. What would be next after that? Well, we, we're manufacturing and launching our product so in uh, Q2 of 2019, and we have a lot of things in the pipeline, and we'll be probably developing the next iteration in 2020, I'm sure. So. Yeah, we're also focusing on just launching the product here in the US. That's a big focus for us. LV Pump is also linked to an app, so there's real-time volume tracking. So at the moment, there's quite basic insight, but definitely around the digital side, providing better content, services, community, and ultimately more personalized programs for women will be a big area of development for us. So for us, we'll be um, 
We are launching Mia 2 in the US and Canada now, uh, starting February 1st. And we are also launching the ecosystem for the daycare. We want to digitize all the daycare in the US. It doesn't make sense that you, you have all the technology with your hands and you go to the daycare and pick up baby and a piece of paper. We want to make everything paperless now. I, I have one more question before maybe we can open up to the panel for a few questions. What would be the biggest advice in terms of creating a product for the market, um, especially the baby tech market? A and what was the most difficult red tape to, to surpass? I think the biggest advice is make sure that you're solving a real problem and that uh, that your product is something that's really needed on the, on the market. Uh, the biggest obstacle was that <laughs> uh, we thought that making a breast massage system would be a relatively simple technological thing to accomplish. Uh, I think that what I've been in the medical device and pharmaceutical field for a very long time, so I know how long development takes, but it's, it's really expensive. And I think that one of the things is to find funders that are willing to really fund startup companies, especially female entrepreneurs have an extremely difficult time attracting. We attract 5% of the money from all venture capital that's invested. And this is one of the biggest things to overcome is to really be able to have the money that you need in order to move forward with a, a good product. Uh, Noreen stole my one. Uh, yeah, obviously, the, the most important thing is to make sure you're solving a real problem. In addition to that, it's just that constant testing of your assumptions. Make sure you have a constant testing and learning loop, and that's going on all the time. Because often for all of us starting these companies, we have, it's a passion project, but we need to keep going back to the users and making sure that we're meeting their needs too. Keep going back to your users, iterate, iterate, iterate. Try to find maybe female invest investors who understand the product more. Would that make more sense? Is it difficult trying to explain this whole world of pumping and breastfeeding? It's not difficult to explain. It's a fine line. People want to see traction. And in order to get traction, you need a product. And in order to get a product, you need to do development and have money. So this is, even with female entrepreneurs, it's still attracting only 5% of the venture capital money worldwide. And this is, I think, one of the biggest challenges for us. And yourself, Giselle? Yeah, for us, because we are a little bit um, ahead of. <laughs> so we launched the product already, but one of the, the um, advice I would think is, you know, creating a hardware is so much harder than software. Because we come from software background. We thought it would be easy. Initially, we planned for six months, and it ended up like four years. Um, because Mia, we want to make it work with every single bottle. So the technology is only hiding in this tiny puck. So for us, that's the biggest challenge. And um, also, as a startup, I think that's very important that you have to survive. You have to be live, otherwise 90% of the company die in the first year. So getting enough funding is very important, also control your budget. You want to value every single penny you're spending. Every single <laughs> Okay. We have time for maybe one or two questions. What time is it? Okay, great. Anyone have a question in the audience? Okay, great. They oh, we have a question. Um, you are all very great women innovators um, who make many people, many parents' life simpler. And um, can you give any advice for women who are working in technology field? I can answer that. Or, or do you want to go ahead? Um, I, I think the best advice is be yourself. As women, I think we have an advantage to have a different mindset and bring different skills to the table. Um, some people might say there aren't enough seats at the table, but I actually think there are more. We just have to take them and bring all that insight. I think a lot more women are needed in the technology field. We just like, we bring a different perspective to things. I can just tell you a quick anecdote. I was coming here with my prototype and our team of engineers are all men who had a big learning curve, even though we had a few women in the beginning. And I turned my prototype on for the 
last time, and even though I'd said it a hundred times, the right breast was labeled the left breast because that's the way they look at the at the at the bra. And so I said, had to say for the hundredth time, this is not no, the left breast is the left breast, and they're still like, is that? looking on or the person? No, so obviously this is my left breast, but if you're looking at me, it's to the right, right? And so at the very last minute, I finally got it changed so that the left actually matches the left. And so we need women to, to, to be in technology if you're developing products for women to and stay the course. And it's not easy, but we, you know, it, it's important, especially when you're developing products for women. It's really hard sometimes, and I and my male engineers are amazing, so I'm not making a sexist statement, but it is different. You have not breastfed a baby. You have not done some of these other things. You can't, and so it takes a female to be able to give input if you're gonna de de develop products that are for women. It's hard. It's not always easy to understand, so. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. You've been amazing. This was such great insight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.